Hey guys, it's Libby, and in a few hours I am going to get on a plane and return to my new home country. But while I'm still at my parents' house, I thought you guys might appreciate if we talked about some of the historical costumes on my mom's vintage romance novels. Now I think Regency romance is the plurality, if not the majority, of historical romance subgenres, but there are other ones, so we will have several Regency romance novels, but we will bookend it with some other eras. I think that these are all from the 70s and 80s, which means they are all hand-drawn as opposed to photographs, um, and I should say I have slightly, I'm slightly less forgiving towards hand-drawn um, costumes because if you're doing a photo shoot you're kind of stuck with whatever costume is available and fits your model and it costs money to change it to make it correct but if you're just drawing it it does not cost money to draw it more correctly so no leniency here so we're going to start with a medieval romance called The Conqueror by Georgette Hare. Now, romance novels about real people, yikes. Romance novels about my great, 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 etc. grandparents, more yikes. I am a Plantagenet. Um, but perhaps the most yikes of all here are these boobs. <laughs> they are so pointy. This woman could not get through a TSA inspection. I know that mega pointy boobs were a thing in the mid 20th century, but in 1066, they literally did not have the technology in order to achieve this. But ignoring those, if we possibly can, this is not the worst medieval gown I have ever seen. Um, this is a version of a blio, which is the French you know, high fashion garment of the 11th century. Um, I'm kind of suspicious about it being in white. I think white is like for underwear, um, but I don't think it's impossible for it to be white. We don't know a lot about the colors, but you know, it would certainly be more impressive to have some richly dyed garment if you are, you know, the queen of bloody England. Um, uh, the cut of the dress is um, reflective of where research was in the 1970s or 80s, maybe even 60s, when this cover was done, um, which is that, that they thought the blio was like a sort of fitted on top with a separately attached skirt. We now think that's not how they did it. They did it, um, you know, with rectangular construction. The the torso and skirt is all one piece, and then it's just the way the the gathers are done that makes it look like this. Um, uh, I'm less pleased with the like. Sh the the trim around the upper arm and the waistline, which is just the pattern that you would find on your mother-in-law's old curtains. And the placement of the trim at the bicep is good, but they wouldn't have trim around the waist. If anything, they'd have a belt, but it's entirely possible there would just be nothing. Um, the sleeves are also cut a little bit off with the, like, you know, the, the split for the angel wing part of the sleeve or the trumpet part of the sleeve starting at like mid forearm. Um, it, it, yeah, you wouldn't have like an angle like that happening in your sleeve. You would cut it on the straight. Um, so that then it's not cut on the bias and it pulls itself down. Um, uh, other than that, dress is not terrible. Uh, I do have to point out her full face of makeup on her, on her very pouty face, uh, and hair down, not covered. Um, one, St. Paul would distinctly disapprove, and two, your hair is disgusting, put some linen on it. Um, let's talk about him. He looks pretty good! Chainmail, good. Helmet, about the right shape for the time period we're going for. Um, I don't really know enough about the cloak situation, but, um, I don't this is not screaming anything wrong to me. The only thing I don't like is his haircut, which is very 14th century um, or even 15th century, and I don't think William the Conqueror was quite that much of a trendsetter. So overall, I am giving The Conqueror a B minus. Now we move on to the obligatory Barbara Cartland. This is The Bored Bridegroom, uh, to go along with the audacious adventurous from last time. I guess she likes um, alliteration. So first off, I'm not going to be talking about him at all because he's wearing a military uniform and military uniforms are kind of their own subset within the costuming world. 
which requires their own special set of knowledge um, about like which regiments were using which colors in which places and like what kinds of buttons did they have and how many and I just don't have any expertise in that area. The only thing that's looking a bit weird to me is his epaulets are red. I, ju I just I feel like that's probably not right. Um, and I do like that there's a third person in this scene. There's this guy behind them who's like maybe dead? Maybe taking a nap? What is he doing there? I don't know. Okay, let's talk about this lady. Um, so it says this is uh, somewhere on the back. It told me this is Regency. Oh yes, it said in 1804. Um, wh so why is she dressed like a Dutch milkmaid from the early 20th century? She's wearing fucking clogs. She's wearing clogs. That's a Dutch thing. This is this is not set in Nederland. Additionally, this like jacket, skirt, apron kerchief thing she's got going on would be great for the 18th century, but we are past that time, my dear. And even so, the poofage of the skirt is just the wonkiest thing I've ever seen. 18th century was about making the modifications at the hip level, not at the knee level. So like, why is, why is the angle like that? It should be like that. Um, and then of course, her hair is down gross. And she has this like layered cut with bangs, which <laughs> would not work very well if you were trying to achieve actual Georgian hairstyles. So this one, uh, just looking, just rating her costume and going D. And now we have a Signet Regency romance. This is Dancing with Clara by Mary Ballow. I hope I'm pronouncing her name right. Um, okay, so first thing I have to say is that I really hope that he was consumed with a sudden passion and had to run out into this garden to embrace his lady love because he is missing half of his clothes. Um, and the only excuse is that he he did, simply did not have time to put them all on. Maybe that happens in the book. I really hope so. Um, but assuming that it didn't, he needs to be wearing a cravat to hold your shirt body closed, um, a waistcoat, and a coat. Just going out in shirt and pants means you are not all the way dressed. Next, I can't see a lot of it, but I can tell that the front closure on his pants is a modern front closure, which is like just one slit down the middle, which you zip slash button up. Um, it's not how they did it in the 18th, 19th century. You've got sort of, it's, it's complicated to explain, but you got sort of two sides that are closing and then buttoning and then you have a flap that comes up over them and buttons here. And there's simply not the space to pull that off. Also, I think he has like pockets, like side pockets. No, <laughs> that would ruin the graceful line of your hips. Men can also have graceful lines to their hips. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say about him. Uh, his hair is not terrible. Let's look at her. Okay, her hair is up. <laughs> However, she is wearing evening wear in the daytime. And these sheer sleeves, I think like the peachiness underneath is supposed to be her skin, so she's just wearing sheer sleeves. I don't think they would do that. Uh, it's certainly not very common. You would have a sheer sleeve over other fabric. Um, in this case, either blue to match the main dress or white to match the trim. Uh, let's talk about this trim though. What in the heck is going on with the lace at her neckline and her waistline? That is not a Regency type of lace pattern. It's weird and pointy and they would not have liked it. Also, I don't like this little, little frills coming out of her sleeves. I mean, one, they wouldn't have done that. And two, if you just made them blue, it would have looked better. Like historically it's a bad choice and aesthetically it's a bad choice. Um, she's also got a bonnet which matches her dress identically. Um, the Georgians were not super concerned about being matchy matchy all the time. Um, but the fact that it does match means that she has a bonnet to go with her evening dress, which is not a thing. Bonnets are for daytime wear, evening dress is for evening wear. Um, and also the way it's cut is ridiculous. If you look at the angle between the brim and the crown, um, when she wears it, it would be standing up like this. It would be like framing her face like this, which is so dopey. Um, and the crowns of Regency bonnets were coming more at an angle, more forward like that. Okay, so this is a C because the cut of both of their clothes 
the amount that they have on is pretty good. Now we have a really quick one, An Eligible Connection by Elsie Lee. All I have to say about this one is no. Okay, let's move on to something slightly better. This is Lord Greywell's Dilemma by Lauren Matthews. This is another signet. Okay, so he looks pretty good. I would say his clothes look a little bit too big for him. They don't fit him super great. Um, and the, the white, the triangle of whiteness in the middle, there's weird stuff going on in there. I don't know what's happening. I think there's, he's got, he's got like two collars. That's what it looks like. He's got one right up next to his face and then one that's sort of been flapped down under his bow tie. Um, where's that second collar coming from? These are the questions that try men's souls. Um, let's look at her. Hair is half up kind of working towards it, but not quite there. Um, uh, her boobs are the wrong shape. We've talked about this before. Modern boob shape is shallow slope on top, steep slope on the bottom. Historical boob shape, or actually like a lot of history, is uh, steep curve on top, shallow curve on the bottom. Other than that, cut of the dress, not bad, if a little bit boring. Um, this better be evening wear with the low neckline and the short sleeves, but it looks like it might be. Um, she does have awfully pointy nails, which I think have been manicured. But yeah, overall, not bad. I give this a B. And now we will wrap up by hopping forward into the Victorian time period. This is from When Books Cost 60 Cents. Okay, so I can't get any information from the back of the first couple pages, but it looks like we're in the 1850s for the most part, so I will be judging it based on that. Um, he looks pretty good. If I want to nitpick, I'm getting like real close up in his necktie, which maybe looks like a modern paisley, but I don't know, it could just be striped. I think he looks good, guys. He's even got this really crisp pleat uh, down the front of his pants leg, which is nice. Okay, she, um, pretty good. The color is very strong, and this is like right around the transition to aniline dyes when you can start to get those really strong colors. Um, so maybe if she's like, high fashion she'd be wearing this strong of a pink. Um, I mean, aesthetically, I don't like it that much, but that doesn't mean it's historically inaccurate. Um, regarding historical inaccuracy, her skirt is not quite as full as I think it should be. Uh, maybe just like 10% more full. And then the only other problem I see is she has a princess seam on the bodice. Um, we are too early for princess seams. This would, this sort of jacket would only be fitted with a dart or two, which is sort of like a princess seam, but only, it only goes up to the bust point. It doesn't like go up over the shoulder. So you wouldn't have two pieces in your bodice front. You just have one piece with darts taken in. But otherwise, I'm very pleased. A minus, well done, Marianne Gibbs's cover designer. It's so hard to figure out who the cover designers are, so I know who to give credit to or who to blame. That's all I got for now. We had some very bad ones and some quite good ones. You never know what you're gonna get when you go diving into the vintage romances. Thank you for watching, guys. I'll see you later.